what I think us humans have done to the earth after stepping out, inventing agriculture, sort of abandoning our original niche or niches in, in, in the normal ecosystem, uh, our populations exploded and we are sort of like a cancer. I mean, I know that if people popularly, I just generally say we're like a cancer on the, on the planet. Well, we kind of are behaving like a tumor. Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at Wake Forest University and AcademicInfluence.com. And today on our show, we have uh, Dr. Niles Eldridge, uh, a big hero of mine, and I'm excited to find out more about you. Uh, it's good to have you here today, Niles. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. And saying that you're from Wake Forest reminds me that I did teach there for, I think, a, a two-week stint. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. It was before my time, but, but yeah, I did I hear you were there. before your time. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well, I, I am fascinated by your entire career, but the thing that I'm most curious about right this moment is, uh, when did you first meet Stephen Jay Gould, and, um, and how was that? How, how did you guys start working together on Punctuated Equilibrium? Um, I met Steve in the fall of 1963. I had decided, I'd spent the summer down in Brazil um, doing a, uh, it was really a, an amazing program in, in anthropology. And I was studying the fishing economy of a little village in, in Northeast Brazil. I was down there with some other students and some faculty. So everything was, everything was cool, but it was an eye opening experience. And I was 19, I turned 20 down there. So I was pretty young, got back and I had already taken a geology course, already had been fascinated in uh, fossils. And where the fishermen parked their boats in Brazil uh, was in a safe cove uh, formed by what they called a reef. It wasn't a true reef. It was, a, it was uh, uh, a formation of sandstone that had been eroded out, made, making a, a nice little safe harbor. But it, had loaded, it was loaded with fossils. So I spent a lot of my time prying fossils. They were very young fossils down there. Anyway, I was totally hooked by that time. Coming back. I, I found it embarrassing to ask people personal questions in Brazil about their lives in a language that I got fairly good at, but not all that great. So I, found, I was a little bit more uncomfortable doing that. But meanwhile, I was digging fossils out of their reef down there and, and thinking that maybe I was going to go into paleontology. So I started taking geology and anthropology courses in Skirmahorn Hall, the two the two departments were in the same building. It said, uh, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee, which was inscribed over the front door of the building. It was built in 1899. I just recently had occasion to look up. So that's from Job in the Bible, speak to the earth and it shall teach thee. Um, so I was hanging out over there and I became aware of a number of students who had just shown up as graduate students in the paleontology program. In fact, I, yeah, I was enrolled in the paleontology course, the one course in paleontology. So that's, I was really, I was there for, you know, an official academic reason and started bumping into these guys. So one of them was Steve Gould. Um, the other was Bud Rollins. Um, both of them became sort of older brother figures to me, but they were very nice and very affable and so forth. And they let me tag along. I went on a long field trip with them um, in the spring of 64 and a whole bunch of other students. So I was actually sort of one of the gang, even though I was two years younger and still an undergraduate. And um, so how did you and Steve come up with the punctuated equilibrium theory together? It sounded like from what you said in your last interview, that this was uh, based on two summers of research in the Eastern United States and looking at trilobites. So, right. So was he part of that research project or you just talked? No, that was my, that was my work. Uh, that, I decided to work on trilobites and try to really look at patterns of evolution that were going there. Steve was doing a similar project on Pleistocene, much younger land snails from Bermuda. And um, anyway, so we, we kept in touch. But actually, I published a paper in 1971 that had the gist of, of the punctuated equilibria idea. And it, meanwhile, Steve had gotten, he had gone to Harvard at, in uh, 1967, I think. He'd left to very, he was two years ahead of me. I graduated in 69, yeah. So he got out at 67. He went up to Harvard, took an opening up there, which was great. And he 
of course, did great things up there. But he got an invitation to uh, uh, take part in a, uh, I think, a really a dynamic idea, a great idea for a book, which was multi-authored, try, trying to inject more conceptual working, thinking in, into paleontology rather than what was taken to be the, it's, it's complex, but the description of what's actually there in the fossil record takes a lot of work and a lot of intelligence, but more interpretive work. What does it all mean? What does it tell us about things like evolution, but things like paleoecology, all sorts of different uh, sort of uh, topics that were under addressed basically by that time in the early 1970s. So Steve had wanted to do uh, a paper on a mor morphology, and uh, for the, but that topic had already been taken. So the only one that he thought would be still attractive was on speciation, and I had already sent him a copy of my paper um, that to Evolution, which was published in that journal in 1971, as I said. He said, I can't think of anything else to say about this um, except for what you have in your paper. So you want to write that with me and we'll see what else we can do, which we did. We expanded on that original paper. And he, um, I, so I wrote the guts of that. And then he wrote some stuff at the end on implications. I wrote some stuff at the end on Im implications. And he wrote a good introduction and he thematically uh, sort of integrated the whole thing. But uh, yeah, the basis of the idea came out of my work on the trilobites that I got my PhD on. Yeah, that's fascinating. I, I, yeah. I didn't know that, that it was starting yeah. from what you had done with your wife and your younger brother. Out yes. In... <laughs> <laughs> really fun. Out well, in the great American Midwest. It was uh, just incredible. Listening to the music, drinking the local beer, which uh, was, you know, whatever. And uh, it was what it was. But we, we, we immersed ourselves. And it was yeah. uh, recognizable. A friend of mine was an anthropologist uh, early on, but not, hadn't done it yet, uh, pointed out McDonald's was really interesting as a homogenization of American culture because the architecture is the same wherever you go. You know, you walk in, you know what the menu is, you know where to go. If you're just going to use the restrooms, you know where they are, and you know that by and large you can just go in and use the restrooms and nobody was in there. But that kind of a thing, uh, we got to see that firsthand. Yeah, I hadn't amazing. done much traveling prior to that, except for I had gone to Brazil. But that's out of the clearly out of the country. That was something completely different. Yeah, as the Monty Python people would have put it. But <laughs> <laughs> but going to Ohio, not so much different, different yeah. ways of serving hot dogs and so on, but similar enough to feel comfortable. In. Yeah. That must have been great. What, what an idyllic way to spend two summers. So, yeah, I didn't realize that that's how the punctuated equilibrium kind of came up, came to be. Um, yeah. And, of course, working with uh, Steve must have been really helpful in popularizing the idea. If, if it hadn't been for Steve, the idea may have just sat in that 1971 paper and not gone very far. Well, without Steve, yes, it would have sat in the 71 paper. I shudder to think. Um, uh, what might have happened had he not come along and say, let's write this paper. He insisted for years that he was not trying to pop popularize punctuated equilibria. But of course, through dint of his writings in Natural History magazine particularly, uh, it got fur much further, greater notice than it would have. But it actually, it first it excited attention within our own profession in this second paper, more so I think, than the original. I pu published that in a, in a journal called Evolution, which is mostly read by geneticists and not paleontologists. We published in a book called Models in Paleobiology. The book was not uh, you know, widely disseminated, but I guess people Xerox that we had. The Xerox machine was, I think, already invented by 1972. It came on shortly thereafter, though. So we didn't have any PDFs, so we couldn't just put them online or anything like that. But dissemination is important. And the book did not sell too many copies, but it got rather widely, uh, the paper still did get rather widely known. And the book itself got fairly widely known. Hmm. Amazing. And do you think that it was um, some of the reaction that Steve got to punctuated equilibrium that made him, for example, want to join the fray in the creationist trial uh, that he was involved in in the late 80s? Yeah, I, yeah, we both were. Uh, 
So you, I was were, asked, you were involved in that trial? I, I didn't. Yeah, I. Okay. Oh, well, here we go. I mean, this is a typical of my relationship with Steve. And we remained friends to the end, of course, and uh, occasionally wrote together and so on and so forth and went hiking, you know, all this kind of stuff. But uh, I was asked by the ACLU to guide their preparations for the trial down in Arkansas. And um, <laughs> this is funny. I uh, just, another thing crossed my mind. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, uh, you're taking me into places that I don't normally talk about. So uh, <laughs> then uh, they brought Steve in. And anyway, there was a meeting up at Tufts University. And I was online at the lunch in the cafeteria. And somebody was also involved in this, this trying to integrate a case and, and get expert witnesses and so off all, all together. And I was still officially the ex, the going to be the expert witness. And a guy behind me said, um, wow, so hi, you know, how, who are you? What do you do? And stuff like that. And I, we were just chatting online in the cafeteria. And he said, are you familiar with the evolutionary ideas of Stephen Jay Gould? And as I told the reporter for Newsweek who wrote this up in the big cover story about Steve, I guess just a year later, uh, I said, I felt like punching the guy in the mouth. And <laughs> that was just an honest answer I, I told to, uh, to the reporter. He published that in that paper on, on, in, on, on the article on Steve in Newsweek magazine, you know. Next time I saw Steve was at a meeting in, in Cincinnati, I think, at a Geological Society of America. And he yelled at me from all the way down the hall, so why didn't you? <laughs> and I said, so why didn't I what? He said, punch him in the mouth. I said, well, you know, I was just talking. You know, sorry <laughs> about that. You know. But yeah, there was always this sort of uh, tension there about, about that. But anyway, Steve was much more... He said to me, um, why don't you be the senior author of the paper? I'll give, I'll give the talk in Washington at the GSA meeting because you're nervous when you, you tend to get nervous when you give talks, which was certainly true, still is, you know, for that matter. But Steve loved to give talks. So that's how that came to be. You know? uh, that's why I became the senior author of, of the paper. But anyway, yes, the original pattern, the original idea was in the 71 paper. Yeah. And, and, and so. so you were about to talk about the Arkansas trial and how Steve roped you into that. So what happened there? Well, actually, he bumped me off that. He was put in. That's the point of my saying about, about the speaking. He, wa he was better public speaker. He was more confident. And um, so I think it th I thought he was the better choice. So I was hired by uh, the AAAS. I think it was the AAAS. Uh, there was a, n a number in the Early 80s, a number of popular science magazines had sprung up. Not many of them have survived, but discover a number of, of these things. And so I think I was, I was doing Science 81, 82. It kept changing its name. I think it was a AAAS early shot at, um, at doing a popular, more popular uh, science journals. And um, so I was their reporter. So I had press credentials uh, to cover that. So I was down there and witnessed so you were the down, whole thing. You were down there, and so you got to re you got to report on your friend Steve and his performance at the Arkansas trial. I did. <laughs> that must have been a lot of fun. It really and, was a lot of fun. So, but my first book on creationism was published in what eighty two, the Monkey Business. So mm, interesting. Yeah. And uh, so did, I was I was get, in it from the get go. Did you get to interact with Michael Roos? He was down there at that trial. Yeah, well. I know Mike. Yes, mm -hmm. we more as crossing swords than anything else. But uh, <laughs> so, so after that whole dust up in the '80s, what did you do subsequently uh, with respect to creationism, or just just with your career? I mean, that was certainly some of some of the highlights of your 1980s was that interaction and the writing that you did. But yeah. then, what what happened after that? Well, I did too. Uh, I was at a museum, so. Uh, I did two public facing sorts of things. One of them was creationism. The other one was the, the, uh, the beginnings of, I would say the second generation of environmentalism and worries about mass extinctions and so forth, which I got into in the late uh, 1980s. And I've written, I guess, five books on the environment. I'm writing another one 
uh, even as we speak, called Gaia side or inadvertent Gaia side. Um, so I'm still very much interested in that. But I, I was doing my regular paleontology research, and I was looking at evolution. At first, we were looking at uh, higher levels of evolution, uh, species selection, and so forth, which I think justly could be seen as coming out of as an implication of the original uh, punctuated equilibrium paper. But I got very interested in the relationship between ecology, which is matter-energy transfer processes on the one side, and evolution, which is the fate of uh, transmitted genetic information from generations to generations and how those things fit together. And I'm still puzzling that out. I wrote a paper uh, this year, actually, it, was, it came out with a cancer biologist uh, showing that cancer in many ways uh, is a parallel system to tumor growth. Is really, He says that tumor growth can be seen as an evolutionary process. And once I finally understood what he was talking about, then I, then I could see that what I think us humans have done to the earth after stepping out, inventing agriculture, sort of abandoning our original niche or niches in, in, in the normal ecosystem, uh, our populations exploded. And we are sort of like a cancer. I mean, I know that if people popularly, I just generally say we're like a cancer on the, on the planet. Well, we kind of are behaving like a tumor growth, out of, po out of control population growth. So there's somatic uh, evolution, cancer being an example of that. So yeah, so keep going yeah. with the ideas. Yeah. So, so what do you <laughs> want to pass on to your children and grandchildren in the next generations about what we should do about this? Uh, okay, what should we do about it? I just wrote a letter this morning to a high school senior in uh, Arizona. And that's what she said. I read, she said, I read your 1995 book called Life in the Balance. And I told her, and she said, I loved every word of it. And I uh, can't stop thinking about it. But now it's, I wonder what you're thinking now, because seem, things seem to have gotten so much worse uh, than they were when you were writing this and doing that exhibit in the mid 1990s. I think it was 1998 when the exhibit opened and the book came out. And I said, you're right. This is what I said this morning. I, you're right. Things are a lot worse. And um, it's sort of regular thing for old people to say the world's going to hell anyway. But now it seems like everybody uh, can agree, you know, that things are much worse than they were in the 1990s. I, you know, the, uh, climate change, I don't think even the climate scientists, they saw it coming in the certainly discussing it in the 1990s, but they did, had no idea it was going to get so bad so quickly. I, I certainly didn't, but I'm not even a climate scientist. I don't even think the climate people could see this uh, accelerating to the extent that it really has. You know what I ended up saying? I, this, the science, of course, is important. We're living in an era where um, facts don't seem to matter as much as they used to to us, so it's all the more important to reinforce our academic uh, endeavors in general, I think, and science in particular. And, and I'm, I'm concerned about the fate of education in general, but also our high-quality research that we, that we do in the United States. I took a different tack, though. I said, if I were going to do this, a thought experiment, but if I were going to do this all over again, I don't know as I'd become a scientist. I think we know <clears throat> an awful lot about, for example, climate change and what we're doing to modify the earth and driving so many species, we can see the scope, if not all the details, of the problems. Would I keep working on that, or would I become a lawyer and work as an environmental lawyer? Like somebody, I'm really impressed with the uh, sort of the back channel, or they, uh, uh, the digital, the uh, what's what's the word for it? the MSNBC and, and CNN. Uh, th those channels with all these lawyers on them all the time, they're so smart and they really know how to get to the, the uh, nitty gritty. And down in Arkansas, I, I met my first lawyer, I, I, I was having dinner with him and I said, how did you learn the philosophy of science so much? Because he told me he had just come flown to Arkansas from LA where he was arguing uh, 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 between two movie studios. He was defending one or he was taking the he was on the legal team of one of two movie studios. Then he's stopping off and discussing philosophy of science on the stand, uh, or leading, leading the testimony of a, a professional philosopher discussing the philosophy of science. 
And that dinner, he was really eloquent on the philosophy of science. I had a hard time keeping up with him and matching him rhetorically, you know. And he was on his way back home to New York to start uh, uh, getting involved with a lawsuit in the state of New York and, and the power company. I said, what is the common thing that um, allows you to skip from these two different, these three different arenas that he was talking about? He said, well, silly, it's the law. The law is the common denominator. I never forgot that. And now I'm thinking, we know an awful lot about what we're doing to the planet. We know the perils of overpopulation. We see, you know, all of the stuff that, we, and, and certainly climate change coming from, we have to cut the emissions and so forth. The outlines of what the problem is are pretty clear. What we need, and, and, and she had this, raised this possibility, this student who wrote me this letter that I was trying to answer, do we need to go beyond the individual, individual people getting alarmed and trying to pitch in and do something and become more uh, policy and systemic oriented with these, uh, with these issues? And the answer is yes, it's, it's high time. It's, you know, obviously we quit the Paris Accords. We should not have done that. And we've got to redouble our efforts, rejoin the Paris Accords, but actually re resume a leadership role. So I see these professionals, and particularly I'm drawn to uh, lawyers. I told your daughter that I had thought originally about being a lawyer. I think I said when she was interviewing me. And I was joking around. I said the guy with the most money in the neighborhood was a lawyer. But that, that idea about maybe I would now go back and knowing what I know now, which is impossible, it's a thought experiment, I would maybe pursue a career in law and, and work for a, an environmental institution, you know, a, a foundation or something like that, or the United States government and try to help that way. Mm. Well, what an interesting way of ending our interview today to think back on that very first thought you had going off to college. Maybe I should be a lawyer and yeah. um, encouraging perhaps people in the next generation to take up law, take up environmental law, and yeah. see if we can't help some way preserve yeah. this beautiful planet exactly. that you got to crisscross in your lifetime, especially the, those two summers as an undergraduate. Oh, they were. <laughs> I but I have to say, no regrets. I don't regret what I actually did end up right. doing. It's but been not only a, fun, but uh, I think it's it's been terrible. Yeah. It's been very interesting. So. And and just as a as a as a plea to the next generation to to take this up as a cause and to institute policies that will help preserve this amazing uh, world we live in. So absolutely. Well, well, thank you so much, Dr. Eldridge, for taking some time with us again today, and we really appreciate you uh, sharing your thoughts. My pleasure.